Hello, hello, hello. It's the Engineering Success Podcast, and it's two weeks in a row. What a miracle. What a wonderful time to be alive as a patron and viewer of the Engineering Success Podcast. Hope you guys are doing all right. It's a beautiful Saturday morning today. It's Saturday, March 11th. I am getting ready to film this episode. Well, I am filming this episode. And then after that, I'm going to go walk two blocks from my house to go watch a St. Patrick's Day parade that some of my coworkers are riding in. And I'm told that there will be cabbage that will be thrown at me. Cabbages and uh, Irish spring soap and stuffed animals and all the like. So I'm very excited to catch some green things. I've You can't really tell because I've got the green screen on behind me and I have the colors pixelated. But if you're watching the video version, I'm actually wearing green. I don't think you can actually tell in the video because it can't be that green or else it'll completely ruin the green screen. But I'm wearing green. I'm doing my part. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to yet another set of parades <laughs> here in New Orleans. I feel like parades are just the, the thing we do here in New Orleans, parades. But, uh, life's going well. And I thought the last episode would be the last episode in this upstairs room, but turns out this might be the last episode. We'll see. We'll see. Update. We're still in the upstairs room for those of you that are tracking where I'm at. But, but yeah, it's. Things are, things are going all right. I'm in a good workflow at work. I, I like the people I work with. Uh, Maddie and I are doing all right. We got, we've still got some of our friends in town. So overall, no complaints. No complaints. The only people that are probably complaining are the people that got the, still the, the last stragglers that are the remaining that got me wedding gifts that I haven't um, finished sending their thank you notes to. Some of them are people that came and visited me during Mardi Gras, and I, I hand wrote them and I got them ready and everything. I just didn't hand them to them, so that's my bad. But what's the decorum for thank you notes? Is it a month, six months before you send them a notice of the fact that you're having a baby? I don't know. I'm probably in violation of all those decorums, but feel free to shame me in the comment section below. But yeah, sorry to those of you that... I am still delinquent on. I promise it's not because I don't want to and not because I'm not thankful. But anyways, yeah, tell me what the decorum is for how soon to send a thank you note because we're approaching a year now. Uh, so I'm probably behind. Yeah, I'm, I am. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> that on that note, <laughs> let's talk about other people that I am thankful for, and I am thankful for my five-star reviewers, and I'm thankful for those who support the podcast. So now is the time where I give John Ott a shout out. Thank you, John, for supporting the podcast. You too can join John Ott in supporting the podcast. Um, $10 a month gets you a shout out at the beginning of every single episode of the podcast. Also, if you want to get a shout out, but you don't have $10 a month, I understand it. I also don't have $10 a month. Uh, you can re leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and you can join those people on the Engineering Success Hall of Fame. So shout out to these lovely folks right here, Kay Goldway, Kelsey Plus, ERB Tucker, that engineering guy 14, and D Dollinger. I wonder who that is. That's my dad, obviously. Uh, shout out to those people who have given the podcast five star reviews. If you give a five star review, I'll read you out at the beginning of every single episode of the podcast. Well, I'll read your five star review, review out at the beginning of the next episode of the podcast, and that's on Apple Podcasts. I will put the link in the comments box below. All right. So with that being said, let's get into the podcast. So interestingly enough, I don't really have that many LinkedIn lunatics this time, but I do have some crazy stuff. So I don't even know if this one's from LinkedIn lunatics. Let's find out. 
This one is titled, Daniel share a screen. This is not, this is in career advice, but I thought it fit the bill. Boss bragged about firing his mom and I don't understand why. Today my boss, a partial owner, told me he fired his mom and hasn't spoken to her in over 18 months because the majority owner told him to. I'm not doubting my reaction or feelings to the comment, but I am genuinely confused as to what he expects an employee to take away from that. What are your thoughts? So my thoughts are, that's uh, not ideal. I mean, maybe maybe the the mom sucked and they needed to be fired anyways, and maybe they have a bad relationship with their mom, but it doesn't sound like they necessarily have a bad relationship with their mom. It just sounds like they're just trying to get a reaction or a rise out of you or something. Let's let's look into that. So they say his, well, that's not there. I can't imagine maybe he's just looking to push buttons, get reactions from people, or maybe it'll, he thinks it, it'll make people fear or respect him. Or maybe he was forced into it and brags to cover up how powerless he felt. I think if he's just trying to push buttons and trying to get reactions from people, then not as big of a deal. But if he's thinking it'll make people fear him, and that sounds like a toxic work environment, I wouldn't be excited for that. But they're your current boss. They're not somebody that you're evaluating as a potential employer. So there is that element to it but uh somebody said to me it seems like he's trying to show you that he believes nobody is sacred everybody is replaceable and that he will value the company's wishes above all else tldr he's dwight Schrute as manager yeah i mean i guess th there are plenty of valid reasons why he would have fired his mom like if she didn't show up to work like you know like also it could be just a joke maybe it's just a joke but and was he really bragging you know, these are these are all questions that people want to know answers to but he hasn't spoken to her in eight, over 18 months implies that she might have done something unthinkable or maybe she just thinks it was unthinkable of him to to fire her uh, it sounds like there's some nuances from that that hey maybe 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 just dig into that and think so what what, what happened and, and and if he goes into it you might be able to find out oh wow um his mom sucked or his mom just really wasn't a good employee, so he, he let her go, and that just makes sense, and there's some hard feelings there. Or you could find out that your boss is a total monster. I think that this really could go both ways. I'll give you a thumb uh, up both, though. This person is what to take away from that is probably to find a new job. Can't imagine doing that with another sharing with others. Yeah, I mean, I don't think my mom is the type of employee that I would fire. And... Honestly, I I don't think any of my family members are the type of employee that I would fire. Then again, hear me out. Maybe I mean, what what what's the alternative? You you tell them to resign. Well, that's just good for the company, you know. I mean, if they tell if they fire them, then they might be eligible for severance, or right. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe I don't know. Anyways, this this could go so many different ways. The fact that he's bragging about it gives me a little bit of weird taste in my mouth. But if I were you, I would maybe say, hey, tell me a little bit more about that and, and see if you can get something out of that. But that is an interesting question. And I would say that your boss is not necessarily, we can't make a determination on whether or not your boss is a lunatic yet. But I, I'd give him like a three to seven range. So... All right, next one. Also not from the LinkedIn Lunatics subreddit, but pretty crazy. I figured why not throw it in there with LinkedIn Lunatics. Here we go. Want to hear the craziest experience I had during a job interview? Hello, everyone. I applied for a position at a small company with around 50 employees. I successfully completed interviews with the hiring manager, the HR department, and the COO. However, despite my efforts, I received a rejection notice. Naturally. I was disappointed and wanted to find out what went wrong, so I asked a friend who worked there. It turned out that during my interview with the HR manager, an AI was utilized to test my soft skills, and I failed to pass the assessment. I was shocked and frustrated that I lost the opportunity because of a machine. This experience has given me some insight into why some people fear technology. Have any of you experienced anything similar? Okay, that was, first of all, a really weird read. I don't know why my AI voice switched in between, but yeah. So you successfully completed 
interviews with the hiring manager. So did it, did it go well with the, I mean, <laughs> did your interviews go well with the human? You said successfully completed. So successfully completed could mean, I mean, I successfully completed the task of drinking water. But maybe somebody else that was there with me while drinking water might have seen that I did a terrible job of drinking water, but I successfully completed drinking water. But, I mean, if if you got good vibes from the hiring manager, the HR department, and the COO, which it sounds like if you got to the COO, unless, I mean, it is a small company, but if you got to the COO, it sounds like you had some good interviews to get to that point. The fact that an AI was used and to test your soft skills and you failed to pass the assessment, I think that that's just kind of stupid on their part. Because unless they, uh, unless that was just yet another data point that they used to kind of contribute to why they didn't think you were a good fit. I mean, if that's the only reason why they made the determination to not hire you, then that would be stupid. That would be stupid because that would mean that they trust the AI more than they trust their own judgment as a company. But I'm guessing it's not the case. And maybe that's just uh, something that they like to point at to kind of absolve themselves from any personal responsibility in the decision. And so that way you're not mad at any particular person. Maybe that's the case. I have never heard or experienced anything similar. That is something else. And this person says, what seems even more disappointing is that soft skills can very much be situation dependent. For sure. In other words, you may not have shown your stronger side because the situation didn't call for it. AI, however intelligent it's, as it sounds and appears to be, is still only something that has been created and programmed by humans and that therefore not only fallible, just like we are, but biased as well. Yeah, so, I mean, if you were a good fit and they made the choice just based on the AI, I mean, that it seems like a very rigid application of the technology. And I, I don't really think that technology like that should be used so rigidly. I think... AI is awesome. It should be used to enhance, right? And, and you can use it as a tool. Like for example, I use it. I use chat GPT to generate the SEO keywords and help generate the clickbaity titles that I put on YouTube. Not clickbaity, uh, attention grabbing relevant to the content title, titles that I put on my YouTube videos. So, I mean, it, it can be useful. And I also, if you haven't figured it out by now, I also use it to structure the articles that I publish on my blog because I don't have time to to do them from square one. Uh, but but yeah, I, I, I AI is useful and can enhance and, and can create help you out with things. But but I wouldn't I wouldn't just lean on it wholeheartedly like that. So I'd say that that's a crazy experience for sure. If they did it rigidly, that's dumb on their part, but I'm sure that they, hopefully for their sake, I hope that they have more trust in their own abilities to do more than just that. So, sorry. I mean, hopefully it just was that you weren't a fit. Um, <laughs> maybe dig, reach into your friend a little bit more and figure out what you can find out. But that is a crazy experience for sure. <laughs> Next question. Switch teams should receive offer letter. I don't like that voice as much. Let's do it again. Switch teams should receive offer letter. Let's pick a different voice. Oh no. Oh no. Am I stuck with this voice? I think I am. I want. I want a different voice. Let's try this one. Switched teams should receive offer letter. Oh no. Switched teams should receive offer letter. No. Letter. Switched teams should receive offer letter. Oh my gosh, guys. Okay, that was David. <laughs> Switched teams should receive offer letter. That's Mark. Switch teams should receive offer letter. And that's zero. Oh no. I think I ran out of free words, guys, from the cool voices. And now I'm stuck with dealing with the lame voices. No, no beef. I, I think I'm going to stick with David. My gosh. Okay. I do like you, Speechify. Thank you. 
No, I will not rate you. <laughs> Question goes on to say, they deleted the post. Question goes on to say, this has never happened before, so I don't know what to expect. Small company recently switched teams, not a lateral move since the new role is two titles up and the two departments are not equal. Think of it as starting at level one, but new role is level three. Should I expect an offer letter? And if not, should I ask for compensation? Okay. So I actually went through something like this and I learned a lot in the process. Um, you should be, you've already, if you've already switched teams and you've already started the new role, you can start put you can push, but you might have missed the boat. Whenever a company when your company starts talking to you about moving into a new role, that is when you begin saying, all right, what is the title? What is the compensation? And when do those responsibilities start? And then you do not start on the ideally, you try to avoid number three, when do those responsibilities start until you have figured out one and two. Now, it is in your company's best interest to prolong that. And there are things like getting approvals and nuances, and maybe even they have to create new things for that to work with other departments outside of your manager, like compensation and, and their management and that kind of stuff. But you really need, you're not going to get an offer letter, but you can still get the terms of your compensation written in an email, or, I mean, you can get an informal offer letter written in an email, your new salary and all that kind of stuff, all that kind of stuff um you should be pushing for before you make the switch otherwise they're really grateful and here's what i said in the comments doubt you get an offer letter as for compensation you should have already started driving those conversations when the concept of the move was first discussed it'll be harder to move the needle with that now but you should start pressing and telegraphing expectations this person said your compensation is determined at the end of the year when you have your performance feedback from your manager. I mean, I guess there is compensation this being discussed as part of the promotion cycle, but it sounds like you switched teams and moved to a different manager. So your compensation is going to be based off of their improvements on where you are from where you started there. So you're starting all over in the improvement category, in my opinion. So you should have gotten a promotion when you switched teams. You should have, and you didn't. And you might have missed the boat, but you shouldn't miss the boat. So push hard. Um, how small, even in larger companies, promoted and or lateral moves do not use offer letter HR style mechanics. That said, there's usually some confirmation one way or another, usually before or after the move. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what I'd say is you, you need to start having that conversation ASAP with your manager to try to fix this. You do, you, you just do. And it's, I, I wish you the best. It may be a bit, very difficult situation for you to resolve, but if you put your foot down in the right way and you do it respectfully and you say, hey, this happened, no pro promotion, no salary. I mean, you gotta you gotta think back. Did anybody promise anything to you? Did, did you have any expectations? What were your expectations based on? And, you know, come up with the justification for why you deserve to be compensated more. Hey, it's more responsibilities, more this, more that, more this, more that. You told me it was. It, the company's um, pay scales are published and this is what it is. You said I mentioned a specific title and that's what, this is what people in that title are getting paid. Anything you can to point towards them promising or indicating that you get a promotion and a pay raise along with this team switch that's what you need to be doing because your new manager i mean shoot maybe they just thought you they got this awesome rock star person at a really affordable salary and they i mean if you just wait till your end of year merit increase cycle you're going up against their merit increase budget not the promotion or moving in from a new team budget so two complete prob likely if your company runs like a lot of companies that i know of two completely different buckets. So you not an offer letter, but some kind of indication of what your compensation would be. All right. Next question. All right, here we go. Man, a lot of the deleted posts. Should I ask why employees I've trained were promoted before me? And sorry, it was deleted, but I have it right here. I'm trying to keep my emotions in check, but I feel really hurt. I received positive feedback all year, went above and beyond my tasks, and I have no issues with any of my coworkers and managers. The only thing I can think of is that I've had five different managers, five different managers, 
in the past seven months since every manager has either left the company or been moved from our team. I'm not sure if my new manager just dislikes me and wants me to quit, or if she has better relationships with the people I've trained who have less experience. Either way, I've started looking for new jobs, but I'm not sure if I should talk to my manager about why I wasn't promoted first. If I do, what are some things I should ask in the meeting? Feeling really disappointed and could use any and all advice right now. So there's a starred reply. So I'm going to read it and then I'll give my thoughts. More than likely, you are too good at your current position, and it is easier to hire someone else than replace their core source of knowledge and expertise, especially if you're a good trainer. Typically, management does not train employees, and it could be that you're too valuable where you are to risk advancing to the next level because there wouldn't be good replacement for the pseudo-mentor position you currently fill, even though you most likely do not get any financial incentive to be the person people lean on for questions, guidance, and training. You've just stuck around longer than most and are good at your job. I suggest you either act your wage and simply just do your job or honestly just leave and take those valuable and marketable skills with you to the next position and please negotiate a higher wage for yourself. You definitely deserve it. Sorry you're feeling unappreciated and I hope you find a solution that makes you feel more valued. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with those path of actions as being the only path of action from here, but I do agree with the context. Likely, you're really good at what you do and that they, they like you in that role. And the question I would ask myself if I were you is, have you been telegraphing your expectations? Have you been advocating for yourself? Because maybe, I mean, I don't know what your performance cycle is. I don't know what your review cycle is with your managers. It sounds like there isn't a really good paper trail of what that is because you've had a bunch of different managers. Maybe it's a management system that tracks those things. But if you want to be promoted, are you advocating for yourself to be promoted is the question. And if you are, then you start banging on that table, banging on that door harder. And and if, if you're still not getting any support that way, then yeah, I think that it's time to either to start acting your wage and looking for another place to go. Yeah. But I want you to do a self-assessment of yourself first because a lot of people, they get in this position and they're like, all these people getting promoted, you keep on getting promoted ahead of me. And then like you look at their promo their, their their file and they they've done nothing. They've done nothing. They, so, and they they go into one on ones and they say, I'm doing great. I'm doing good at this role. Look at all the things I'm doing with this role. I'm doing great at this role. And never in their conversations with their manager, they mention that they're interested in anything different. And I will say, part of this is on your manager. They should be asking you these things. But it sounds like you've had incompetence or lack of continuity in your management structure. So that might also be contributing for it. Because if you don't have a single streamline of advocacy for you, then yeah, it's going to be difficult for you to move up to a different position. So is there somebody that is a level up from your manager or somewhere else in your organization that you have a relationship with that can advocate for you, that you can telegraph your goals to? And communicate? if you like staying within your current organization, that's what I'd recommend doing is, is finding those advocates, finding those people that can speak on for you, uh, push forward for you. And that'll be a really good resource for you. But yeah, go, go, go for it. You, it's not unreasonable to ask why employees that you've trained were promoted before you. I wouldn't do it from a state of disdain. What I would stay and said is, hey, I'm really good at my role. I've been interested in other positions, but I'm noticing that I'm not really getting the opportunity to do this. Or I am I being considered for opportunities? What have I been considered for? What do I need to do to be a better advocate for myself? Come at it from that angle, which may not be the truth. But if you come at it from that angle then it's, you know, less indignant and, and, and they're more, maybe a little bit more work, interested in being less well, non-combative with you in that interaction. But I, somebody else went on and said that the, some boss, I mean, if you have a really bad boss, then they might try to block your promotions because of their own personal self-interest. But I mean, you've had seven of them or five of them in the last seven months. So I, I doubt all of them that were that way. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't frame it like they made a mistake because again, it's going to be combative. So I would say is, Hey, what do I need to do to ask? And what are, what are some ways that I can grow into X, Y, and Z telegraph the roles that you're interested in and say, Hey, I think I'm doing all these things really well. Like, Hey, if you, if you want to be a manager of the department, say, Hey, I'm interested in maybe being a manager for the department one day. And obviously, I know everything there is to know about this role. I'm an expert at this role. I train people. I have been the de facto trainer for everybody for the last years. I coordinate assignments. Just talk about the things that you do that are related to management. Hey, what do I need to do to, who do I need to talk to? What can I do to kind of get considered for management roles? Um, but yeah, I, 
I, I would be more concerned about the fact that, uh, well, not more concerned. I'd also be equally concerned about the fact that you've had five managers in the last seven months. I would want to unpack that and see what the issue is with the culture in your company. But yeah, uh, um, yeah, there's a, uh, just make sure that you're having those regular conversations with your managers. And um, if your organization functions the way mine does, then sometimes you not only get to work, have conversations with your manager, but also with your director um, or the person above your manager. So you can kind of get that second level. You're not stuck in one level of one-on-one, but talk to them about your promotion cycle, what you're wanting, what you want to do next. And, and if you're still not getting anywhere, then yeah, then you, then you start taking your finger out the door and maybe, maybe your foot's already out the door, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's good to at least talk about that kind of stuff, but don't come at it from a frame of disdain because that just doesn't really add anything to it. All right. Next question. Advice after being fired from an internship? Hi, I wanted to share my experience at a recent internship because I'm honestly not doing well. I was an HR intern. Prior to this, I have have had non-experience in the corporate world. I come from a humble background. Both my parents worked non-corporate jobs. I grew up in hood and it's hard to admit this but I feel I might dumb and here's why. My internship gave me a work laptop to work with projects. I transfer a work documents to my personal computer just cause the screen is bigger and it more comfortable to use. Unfortunately, I didn't know this was not was not allowed. I genuinely didn't know that. I feel dumb cause I, cause I feel I should have known that. Because no one in the HR team sat me down and told me the policies slash rules. Okay, that is terrible. Aside from that, Outlook has the option to have two emails because I feel like um two emails together. I was sending out the test emails, a draft that was going to be sent out to the employees of the company, to my team with my personal email. It was a mistake because the two accounts were connected when I did the mail merge. The HR lady said that even though those accounts were connected when I did... The HR lady said that even so those emails are their property and classified... Man, this is hard to read even for the AI, and this internship was remote. And the manager was keeping track if I was online through Microsoft Teams status. Basically, if I was home, I would need to let her know if I sat out or had lunch. But most of the time, I was at home and didn't, that, didn't, like, didn't think that was the way I was being monitored. Amongst other things, she told me I lacked soft skills. I was at this internship for less than a month. I admit to the mistakes I made purely out of ignorance. I'm heartbroken because of this. I'm trying to keep my spirits up because it feels like I'm being penalized for a mistake I made that I wasn't aware of. And when I think I feel dumb because I, it should have been common sense. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. It's, it may be a little bit common sense to, I mean, you're in HR, so you're dealing with people's personal files. So that stuff is proprietary and uh, most companies have policies. But hey, I would chalk it up as a lesson learned, really. I, I would chalk it up as a lesson learned. You you want if you want to work in HR, then you know that the information you deal with is confidential. And generally, yeah, all of your work correspondence should be done on your work email. Doing stuff like that on your personal email is a major no no because that's just a you're, you're getting it out of their system. They can't track it. It's not traceable. Well, it is traceable, but I mean, then you're storing company stuff on your per personal email, and that's just not not good and it I, i'll be i'll be honest it sounds like you just from the, i mean obviously you probably type this on your phone or on your laptop really quick in one setting but yeah you, you might want to work on some of your soft skills as well but and yeah it, i mean a remote internship is tough and and it sounds like you're being a little bit micro watched but maybe you gave them reasons for them to do that uh, based on how you were <laughs> behaving in the internship, maybe they they're like, "Hey, I can't reach this person, so let me just start tracking their status." But I think you know, you just leave it off your resume and, and chalk it up as a lesson learned. Um, I wouldn't say that you're dumb. Don't don't don't. I mean, you can feel feel the way you want to feel, but don't don't think you're dumb. You just you had your. That's what internships are for. It's about learning about how to function in a corporate environment and. Now you know you've learned some very valuable lessons, and what I do is is take those lessons and and learn from them. Uh, think about them, reflect on them, and and learn from them. 
I would say that that's the goal of your first internship is to learn how to function in a corporate structure. And that's what I, the main thing I got away from my first internship is, is that. So I'd say that you've learned a lot of valuable lessons, keep it out, out, out of your resume and stop managing your personal email from your work machine. But yeah, the, here's a good comment. I'm surprised you didn't do any induction training that covered the handling of confidential information. Yeah, I would I would say that if they didn't give you training on that, that's kind of a mistake on their part, but you still made the mistake. It's still a, a mistake on your part. But, you know, those are the kind of things that you want to read up on and, and be aware of. So I wish you the best of luck. But yeah, I, you've learned some valuable lessons. You've learned the most valuable lesson that you could probably learn from this internship and uh, keep it off your resume. Next one. A friend of mine was looking for a job yesterday. This must be hella illegal, right? Guardian, Go Guardian Teacher Pro must be installed on all of your and your spouse's devices so we can live monitor what you do on and off work business hours, read your browsing history, and key log to access your digital journal. No way. This can't be real. What is Go Guardian? teacher. It's a Chromebook monitoring and teacher facilitator application that helps students learn safely, stay focused, and get engaged. Um, yeah, no, I would not consent to this. <laughs> this is crazy. I mean, I can understand them wanting them to put that on your, on your, on your machine and your company machine, but definitely not on your personal devices or your spouse's devices because your spouse is not an employee. This is kind of, this is, this can't be, this can't be real. I mean, this can't be real. Even if it is. <laughs> This is insane. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no. No, no, no. This is probably a scam. <laughs> I would there's 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 a few things in the world that would just make me go immediate no to a potential job opportunity. And this is one hundred percent one of them. <laughs> Somebody said this cannot be real. What company is this that expects you to agree to this? LOL. World Scam International Scam Incorporated Incorporated or Safety Capital Asset Management TM. Sounds legit. Oh, man. Yeah. Great application for managing school devices in the classroom, but even the most intrusive administration and school boards forcing educators to give access to personal devices on or off duty would not be tolerated by anyone I know or work with. That is crazy. No, avoid at all costs. That's insane. So no, you should not allow them to install tracking softwares on your personal devices and your spouse's devices to track you for when you're off work. No, that is not an appropriate ask from a potential employer. Just want to make that understood. I don't know if it's illegal if you consent to it, but it sounds crazy. All right, next question. And let's see if Mr. Scam Voice Guy can go a little bit faster. Let's go. Let's change those settings. All right, here we go. Saw a job ad from my company for another position of my same role, but with a much higher starting salary. I work as a superintendent for a small but fast growing home builder. I got an email for a job posting in our company for another superintendent, but for salary, it lists from $80,000 a year. 
from my understanding, that means 80,000 would be your base, your starting point. We do receive bonuses, but definitely not enough to reach 80,000 combined with our starting salary of 50,000. Am I right in thinking that that's what the job ad means? Yes. It does lift supplemental play, bonus pay, but I believe that if they advertise from 80,000, that means you're guaranteed to make 80,000 and any supplemental pay is extra. Well, you know, if it's a guaranteed bonus, then maybe they're being loose with their words. I'm already planning on pushing for a raise as I've been here for a year now with no salary increase, but this job ad listing 80K has made my plan of approach any di very different. Any insight would be much appreciated. Yeah, that is interesting. Your thinking is likely correct. The reason is simple. You're underpaid significantly. I agree. You are definitely underpaid significantly. Yeah, yeah, you are 100% underpaid significantly. Um, what I would say is, <laughs> should I just come in and say, hey, saw the job ad for my position. Looks like this is the new starting salary. When can I start? <laughs> and then let them, let them, let them explain away. That is, that is something interesting. I, yeah, I would say that your your inclination is correct. If it's starting salary from eighty thousand dollars a year, that's correct. Now they might have created some other title that is not your title that is very similar to your title and has the same roles and responsibilities as your title that you're not, somehow not qualified for. But yeah, that is that is something else. That is that is one hundred percent something else but yeah you're you're 100 right that is that is what i'd say is that if it's i mean i'm just kind of in shock but yeah you're, you're underpaid I, I would i would start i would start asking for that 80k now and and see what they say and you say that's the impression i'm getting 50k is a fairly low salary compared to my position in other companies in the same area so i would i would also go ahead and start applying for those other companies if you've already figured it out i mean you say i'm not looking anywhere else for employment i do enjoy working for this company as they overall have a great work culture but obviously culture isn't going to pay your bills well you gotta and i mean keep on advocating for yourself but you it's you've kind of made your bed here so but yeah i i would What I would do is I would I would start interviewing at the other companies like this person says here and go ahead and print out the ad and, and go ahead and start interviewing to other companies and tell them what you expect to make, which should be more than 80,000 because your experience is maybe 85, 90, 100. And start interviewing and seeing if you can get that offer and then take that ad, take your offers to your current employer and say, hey, looks like you're paying 80. They're offering 90. What can you do? And 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 be ready to leave because. I mean, yeah, your culture is great, but cult is culture worth 50%, sorry, 75% raise? I don't know. I, I, I find it hard to believe that it is. So, I mean, there are companies I specifically wouldn't work for, for that kind of money. But I'm sure that there are a lot of great companies out there that have great culture and great people to work with. And that's why there's people that are currently employed by those companies. So... Um, don't let culture pay the bills. That's for sure. Next question. Also, I figured out what's going on. So I don't have the premium version of this text to speech thing. So what it's doing is it's, is it's taking my text and slowing it down. So let's try this next one. Let's do this. Next question is, as follows. Received an entry level EIT offer. Am I crazy to be expecting more? Salary is 56K with a one year evaluation bonus of $3,000 CAD. 10 days PTO. Near Vancouver, BC with a high call. 
Water Resources Consulting. The average for a water resources EIT in the area according water to Glassdoor. Water Resources Consulting. The average for a water resources EIT in the area according to Glassdoor is $69,000. I have one year of semi-related experience and a BSc. Should I negotiate higher? Edit to add thanks for all who've weighed in. While the salary is low, I think the company offers a lot for career growth and I'm genuinely interested in the work. With no other offers on the table right now I'd be more likely crazy to pass it up. It's livable pay, good experience, and that's all that really matters for a fresh grad. Thanks. Okay, first of all, sorry for the interruptions of the voice thing. I thought I had it figured out. But as podcasting goes, it's live, it's one shot, and I it worked fine for me last week, and it's not working this week, so I might have to go back to the drawing board on it. But I would say you're not crazy for being to be expecting more. It's low. I think you should acknowledge that it's low. Um, but if their pay is that low, I would also expect that they don't expect to be able to retain talent. <laughs> so, I mean, come on, they're not stupid. Th their strategy is they pay people less, they hope that enough of them stick around long enough to make it worth it. That's what their strategy is. I mean, they've done an out, there's people in their company that do compensation analysis, there's people in their company that do studies. There, there are people that their job is to come up with pay schemes like this. So they know what they're doing. And you shouldn't be guilted into thinking otherwise. But yeah, I would say take the job. It's stupid for you not to have a job. I mean, not stupid. It would be bad idea for you to set, go, choose between underpaid job and no job. Whenever underpaid job is something that you're interested in and in the field you want to do and get you paid, you can live off it. And I'd say just keep on looking. I mean, I mean. That's low, especially in a high cost living area. That's low. So I'd say take the job, get what you can out of it. But a year from now, if you say, if you leave, you, if you're interviewing and somebody says, hey, why are you leaving? I'm like, realistically, the work was great. The environment was great. It was a great first job out of school, but the pay was not competitive. I took it because it's my first job. I'm looking for a place that pays competitively. And then you tell them your salary expectations and then they, the new company meets it. And like, oh my God, what were you making before? And you say, I don't, I'm not going to tell you, but, but yeah, or maybe you don't even tell the potential new employee that an employer that you're being underpaid at your current job. Maybe that's bad advice. Don't, don't take that. But I'd say it's pretty low. That's for sure. I'd say it's low. So yeah, I, I'd say take the job, but yes, your expectations are reasonable. Their PTO is kind of on the low end too, to be honest. But that's their strategy. That's what they expect. So it wouldn't be unreasonable for you to keep looking and find a better employer. All right, next question. Oh my gosh, I'm so sloppy. Let's try again. Offered promotion and got humiliated. Hello all, I was recently approached by the manager of another department for a better position and pay. Was said that I would be a great fit and that the only thing left is for the main manager to see me and the HR process would begin. The main manager saw me and humiliated me. Said to me that they never ever considered me for that role. That they need someone with more experience in that specific area and that if I was interested in that position, I should have applied through LinkedIn, even if it's my company. I was baffled and said that I am not interested now. I was left with a bitter taste in my mouth and confusion. What do you all think really happened? Edit just to clarify. My manager was not part of the above story. I was referring to the managers of the other department. My manager gave me his blessing when I asked him. Yeah. So first of all, sounds like you dodged a bullet because that second manager sounds like not the kind of person you want to work for. But what it sounds like is so one manager approaches you and that'd be the manager that you were working for approaches you and says, hey, I want you to work in my department. That sounds like they did not run this by their other man, their manager or the other manager that they work with. It sounds like it was their manager, uh, the main manager. Yep. Yeah. So their manager 
did not run it by, did, did, did not run it by them. And then you got brought into the situation that you were very right, rightfully being approached and considered and you, and you went into the consideration and either a, <clears throat> you flopped, which in my opinion is less likely or B they, they have a culture issue. And that second person is just, <laughs> I mean, the second, the second person just didn't, or that second person just didn't think you were fit. And you know what the first person should have done is they should have said, Hey, my manager. So, so I'm going to say manager director. Hey director. Um, I'm considering this person. This is why I think they're a great fit. They're a great fit in these things. What do you think? And then the director goes, Hey, okay, cool. Um, let's see that you're a great fit in these things, but I'm really looking for these things. Do you think they have these things? Can you find out? And then first point of contact manager should have reached out to you and found out if they have these things. And then they would have been able to go back to their manager and say, Hey, they have the things I told you about, and they also have these things. So I think they're a really good fit. I think you should meet them. The fact that you were able to even talk to this person and they said, it's not like it's your manager advocating for you. It's another manager in another department. So the fact that they were able, even able to talk to you and give you that feedback is a bad issue in their chain of command. And again, you've dodged a bullet. So that's what I think really happened. Let's see what the comments think. So from what I understood, there are two managers in the other department. One below said you'd be great for the role and the other higher up said you wouldn't be. I mean, why'd you get approached by the lower one if he isn't able to make a hiring decision? Why listen to him? Overall, I don't quite understand the story, but regardless, the higher up manager of the other department shouldn't have made you feel that way. I agree. Some people are dickheads. I er interviewed early in my career as a super ambitious high performer. One of the interviewers was an, on an ego trip and kept asking me stupid questions he knew the answer to. Jokes on him. I have far surpassed where he is and we're still in the same industry. Burning bridges goes both ways and it was unprofessional. So I'm sorry that that happened to you. That's, that's not right. And they should have a better line of communication in their org. And honestly, it's not, it's less of an indication of you and more of an indicate indication of what they are as an organization. And I think that you dodged the bullet because you're still with the manager that obviously advocates for you, that is okay with you going into new roles, keep on thriving in that role. And then eventually they will let you move on to a role in another part of your organization that you can also succeed in. So that's what I have to say about that. All right, next question. How do I flex to my manager about my high performance? I am a new grad engineer, been at my company for about 11 months. Big tech company, not fun. My title is software engineer one, and the next role is software engineer two. I am working to get a promotion by August of this year, about the 1.5 year mark. Recently, since late December, my performance has went to another level. I am doing my sprint tasks as well as providing operation support for platform issues on our SaaS product and help resolve live issues when I am not even on call. All the SD2S come to me for help with their coding and a lot of them don't have the business understanding and design understanding of our systems. These guys have been here for about 8 to 9 months now. I do not want to throw them under the bus. How do I flex to my manager in the one colon one that I am performing better than the SD2s on my team and the other ones in our larger org so that this is something that is logged towards the promotion? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't make it about them, right? I'd make it about you and the roles and responsibilities. So what I would say is, and by the way, I'm going to change that speed to go faster next time. I would say, hey, manager, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I've accomplished. Do you agree? And they say, yeah. And they say, so then you say, well, my understanding of the SD2 role is these roles and responsibilities. Is my understanding correct? Okay. And then once you establish that you're performing at that SD2 level, and you can describe what the other SD2s are doing, or you can just describe what the job description is in your company. But, you know, just maybe just say, hey, you know, from what I'm seeing, you know, the, the, this is XYZ or what SD2s are expected to do. And you can describe what the other SD2s are doing um, and say, hey, what, what, what's my gap? What do I need to do to hit that SD2 level? 
to get that promotion? Am I on track for that promotion? And and when is the promotion cycle? And then, you know, just straight up, hey, am I getting pro promoted in the next cycle? Should I expect a promotion in the next cycle? And B, when is that, when do those promotions actually happen? Because then you can decide whether or not you're willing to wait for that or if you want to push for an out of cycle promotion is what I'd say. So yeah, definitely don't want to throw them under the bus. That's really good on you. Good foresight. And here's what they said. This, here's what this person said. I've been in your position and I, here's how I swung the promotion. I charted the gap between my current hired role and the next position. I pointed out that I'm already doing the job so my title should reflect it. Furthermore, before any of this, I prepared to move to a new company in case I did not get the promotion. My reasoning not getting the promotion after showing these facts means the manager or supervisor is happy to keep me at a lower paying, lower value role for the work of a higher one. It also shows they didn't value my desire to do more. So that's exactly what I described. Talk about the roles and responsibilities for the higher one. Talk about what you're already doing. Say, hey, I think I'm already doing it. I think I'm actually performing even higher. When do I get promoted? It's not, not a matter of am I getting promoted, but like when. And so you take it from take it from a, hey, Re you both reach that agreement that yes, you're performing here or no, you're not, but you, you basically chart that gap. And then you say, when, 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 and every single time you have a one-on-one, -on -one, you ask them when, 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 and that's what I'd say, but cheers to you for doing well in your new role. That is great. But yeah, just, just continue to be an advocate for yourself. It sounds like you already are trying to advocate for yourself and that's great. That's kind of how I've taken my approach to my career is I, I'm always thinking about, I'm always present in my current role, but I'm always thinking about the next one. And that's the way that you should be is you're always present, always wanting to do well in your current role, never overlooking your current role for the next one, but also always advocating for your career growth. If you want to have career growth, you need to be an advocate for yourself. You are your best advocate. Nobody else is obligated to advocate for you. So you need to do the job of advocating for yourself. All right, next question. And I'm getting a flow of this new workflow here, so thanks for thanks for helping me out. All right. New job and nervous to ask for two week vacation. Help. Started a new job in January. Have been planning a two week vacation for end of September. Will be almost ten months into job. Realized I probably should have mentioned it during the interview process, but anxiety got the best of me. I'm based in the U.S. where two week vacations are not the norm. Is it a bad look slash career ender to take a two week vacation, especially being new to a job? I'm thinking of offering to work for part of the two weeks since this is eating me alive. Yeah, no. So here's what I would do as a person that works in the US. I, for example, I am having a baby and okay, this is going to show that I live in the US, but okay, I don't have paternity leave, but I'm going to be taking off an extended period of time when my baby is born. So what I've done is I've told all the people I work with, when my baby's born, I'm going to be gone for X amount of weeks. It's going to be dependent on when the baby's actually born, but I'm going to be gone. And you're not going to be able to contact me. I mean, I'll help out with a couple emails here and there, but that's about it. I'm going to be gone. And then, and then they're like, okay, that makes sense. And I found out about nine months in advance <laughs> of the baby being born. So a little bit less time uh, than you. Warning. And they're like, yeah. And and that's what you should do. You should say, hi, happy to be here. Um, and then whatever whatever you do is what I do is I just put my vacation on the calendar. Just, just say, hey, I'm taking a two week long two week long vacation on these days. Thank you. That's it. I don't think it's a bad look or a career ender to take a two week vacation being new to a job. Not at all. I mean would it be a weird look if you took a two week vacation on your first day? Like starting on your first day, maybe like if you didn't show up for the first two weeks, then I'd be a little bit concerned, but no, this is not a career ender at all. If you've accrued the PTO by then use it. If, if you get it all at the beginning, then they gave it all the gave it all to you at the beginning. Do so you use it? Um, this person says, you should have asked when the offer extended. I would speak to your manager now. Okay. No, I mean, I don't really think you should have asked when the offer was extended. You should have gotten an idea of what the PTO policy was when the offer was extended. But should you should should you have asked off for that vacation whenever the offer was extended? I don't think so. 
I don't think so at all. I don't think you're required to do that at all because why give them another data point to potentially not hire you? No, it's months away, months away. So just put it on the calendar. Talk to your manager about it now. Don't procrastinate it. You know about it. So just tell your manager, hey, I'm going to be in Europe backpacking for two weeks. And your manager should, if you have a good manager, your manager should say, should say that is awesome. Let's do whatever we can to make sure we have the right coverage during that time. And that'll be great. So that's what you should do. Put it on the calendar, tell your manager now, and then you can plan for it. Seriously. And then you're maybe your manager, this way, if you have any long-term projects, your manager can assign you for projects that end before then so that there's no coverage gaps. It's not... And this person says, no, but you should have asked about arranging time off for the two weeks off as soon as you accepted the job. No, just ask now. It's way off. As long as you have the PTO, take it. Take it. Just take it. I, I mean, what the worst they're going to say is, oh, no, we don't want you to. And then then you can kind of manage it. But I, I think that. I mean, unless you're really nervous about your performance, but I don't think you should be really. I mean. I get it. You, you think because you're in the probationary period, maybe in the US, but I mean, no, just just talk to your manager. Say, hey. FYI, I'm planning to take a vacation on these days. What do I need to do to ensure that we have coverage so that that way you guys are good to go while I'm gone and don't have access to my phone or email? That's what I do. So, but I mean, it sounds like you're the, the right kind. I mean, the kind of employee that wants to be helpful. So I, I don't think you'll have too much issue with, uh, with getting support on the other end. So good luck. Here we go. Next question. Senior in high school. Need some advice with electrical engineering in college, undergraduate? Hi everyone. I'm a senior in high school and I'm dead set on doing electrical engineering in college. I understand the difficulty and I'm prepared to take on the challenge. However, I need some advice with colleges. I know this might not be the best subreddit to ask, but I feel like I could get some good advice from a financial standpoint from real ease. So I'm a student from New York and I got into great out-of-state engineering schools like U Wisconsin Madison, UIUC, and Virginia Tech, but the cost of attendance for these schools is way beyond what my parents can afford. Per year, I would have to pay 51k for UWSCO, 62k for UIUC, and 60k for VT since I'm out of state. My FAFSA EFC is like 41k so I was super sad to see the cost of attendance so high. I really wanted to go to a prestigious engineering school but I can't without breaking the bank. My family is middle class and my dad especially wants me to avoid large loans but I don't want to go to an in-state New York school because they're not as prestigious to me. I feel like I wasted my time in HS because I put a lot of work in to get great grades and stuff and I can't even go to a prestigious school and I'm really sad about it. Please let me know if an EE degree is worth getting into debt for at a big name school. Please be brutally honest. I appreciate any advice. Thank you, SM. So I'd say it's not. It's not worth it. I, I seriously, I mean, your, your degree, the, the electrical engineering degree, regardless of where you get it from, I mean, it, it'll have an impact on maybe some of your, your friends that you make because, you know, you're going to be at different schools, but I mean, you're going to make friends everywhere. Um, it'll have maybe a little bit of impact on on getting your first job, and that'll be based on the network that you, the universities that you're going to have. Um, and it'll, but that's about it. Once you, once you're a working professional, nobody gives a rat's tail when you're going to college at all. As long as you have the degree and the work experience, that's all they really care about. Seriously. That's all they care about is what you've done. So I would say, and that's where the flexibility of not having massive student loans comes into play. Because say, for example, if you have a lot of student loan debt, you're going to be really pressed to just take the job that probably pays more money versus if you didn't it ha didn't have the student loan debt, you could have the flexibility to be maybe a little bit more aggressive in your career pursuits. So, I, you know, take a risk on this role or take a risk on that role. Take this opportunity that seems a new thing instead of sticking with the stable thing that you know could pay off your student loans. So, yeah, I, I would say I was I was kind of in a similar boat, right, where I I worked really hard in high school. I graduated at the top of my class and then I didn't get into my dream school, but I, I mean, I could have gone 
wait list on that, but it would have been just so cost prohibitive. And I'm glad that I went with a more affordable option. I mean, here I am saying that my private institution that I attended was a affordable option, but it was definitely a lot more affordable than what you're describing for Wisconsin, UIUC, and Virginia Tech. And I mean, yeah, that's that's awesome that you got, you got into U of I and VT and Wisconsin. I mean, those are great schools, but I wouldn't say it's worth going into that much debt for, seriously. I mean, that is just, especially if, if, if it's your cost is like less than half to go to, to go to um, a local school. So, I mean, maybe you can get the other schools to match, but yeah, I would, I would, I would focus on minimizing debt because your employers won't care that much is what I'd say. Um, everybody says nobody call cares what college you went to. I'm a UIUC EE, very strong program, but of course I'd say that I was in state Illinois. Just to offer a su suggestion on a scenario where finances are a major factor, the community college near UIUC is pretty good for gen ed, maths, physics, etc. These classes are huge auditorium lectures for all engineering undergrad at UIUC, and you really don't get anything special being part of it versus fun place else. You could consider attending Parkland or similar for a year, get Illinois residency, 12 months in state, and then transfer to UIUC. If you did this, then the cost of tuition is roughly half. Alternatively, you could just pay the out-state premium where you go the first year and make sure your living arrangements meet the criteria for in-state the next semesters, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's something that you could think about to lower your costs, um, applying for scholarships. Some universities, state schools like UT, I know, have like out-of-state resident scholarships to lower your tuition to match the in-state tuition. I wouldn't give up it on it entirely, but I wouldn't go in massive debt for it. That's for sure. And I know that it feels like you you worked really hard and you don't feel like you are getting to see the fruits of your labor, but the fruits of your labor is the fact that you're in a position where you can make this decision and you're a smart person. So you can make the smart decision here, which is realizing that the prestige of X, Y, Z may not be worth completely saddling yourself for the rest of your life with insurmountable. I mean, that's a massive amount of college debt. Massive. I mean, $62,000 a year, that's like $250,000 of student loans across four years. And that's just on tuition alone. Or unless that's the cost of attention. Con that's, unless that's your cost, total cost of attendance. But yeah, I would, I would say, I would say that's a lot. I mean, that's too much. But this other person that gave the advice of going to a local community college is, that's great advice. And then you can establish residency while your gen ed's out of the way. You'll save a lot of money doing that. And it's state school. So, you know, that'll all transfer. So that's what I'd say. Um, you, you, you might even say, hey, thanks UIUC for admitting me. It's completely unaffordable for me to attend right now. You can talk to your admissions counselor about this. Say, it's completely unaffordable for me right now. Is it possible that I can defer my admission, get my basics done at community college and then transfer in? And I mean, it seems like you will be able to from the way that this person described it or, but yeah, to kind of see if they'll work with you. Cause they obviously want you to go there. They accepted you. You said you look, I mean, yeah, you got into some fantastic engineering schools. Um, so at least kind of surf those things out before you give up on the dream entirely, but maybe your college experience won't be exactly what you pictured it to be, but I mean, you got your whole life ahead of you. So I wish you best of luck. You seem like a great student, diligent, hard worker, and I know that you'll be successful and make a good decision for yourself. But no, it's not worth the debt because then you're going to have to make decisions based off of money entirely and debt, and you're going to be paying off that debt for the rest of your life. All right, next question. Should I have gotten more of a pay increase? Hey all. I am contemplating leaving a job I have been with for seven years. In the time I've been there I now make 9k more than I started. Looking at a place that is willing to start me 20k more in salary. Is 9k in seven years bad? I do feel like I wish I made more as anyone would but have received mixed opinions on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, you should have. You should have been making more. And what I'd say is seven years, 9k more. I mean, we don't know what we don't know what your base salary is, but it sounds like, yeah. I mean, basically for seven years, um, over seven years, you should have been making about 5% increase a year. 
So 1.05 to the fifth. Where's my calculator? Where's my handy dandy calculator? Come on. Well, I know you gotta have your calculator handy. You're a nerd. Oh, God. I swear it's around here somewhere. Also, I just figured out that I wasn't actually recording this podcast episode, so I'm gonna jump off my back balcony now. Um, that's great. Um, okay. Let's go 1.05. I'm gonna have to use my phone. Or actually, I'll do it on here. Calculator. So, 1.05 to the fifth. To the fifth. No, come on. To the fifth. I want to do that. Sorry. 1.05 to the fifth. Equals. To the fifth. Equals. So that. So 1.27. So in seven years, making 9K more. So 9 divided by 1.27. Well, no. So that is the raise you've gotten. So so point okay, 9 divided by 0.276. So you're making 32k. I think no no, I'm I'm I don't have all my math in front of me, but it seems like yes, you were making either you're making hardly anything beforehand, or, uh, or, yeah, they're not giving you the enough annual increases. So I'd say, yeah, if you, you have a place that's going to start you at twenty k more, then yeah, go ahead and take it. And yeah, you probably should have gotten more of a pay increase, but it's hard for us to know exactly without knowing what you made beforehand. So. Yeah, go for the new job. That sounds awesome. Good luck. All right. And that's the podcast, it seems. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. A little bit of a cluster mess today. I just realized now that I didn't record the podcast. So I'm going to have to download the stream, which hope that it was of high quality it, i didn't see it dropping the whole time but so if you're listening to the audio podcast the audio and everything might just be a little bit messed up plus i completely messed up with my robo voice i'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board on that i thought it was a great idea to give myself natural breaks to drink water during the podcast but it just was a mess but yeah, that's been the podcast. I, I really appreciate you guys listening in. Uh, make sure to leave your five-star reviews. Make sure you share it with your friends. Um, trying to do a podcast episode almost every single Saturday morning before Maddie wakes up. That's the goal. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. I'll catch you guys in the next one. And this has been it. Peace. Communicating, I miss communicating. I just made a pilot, then they threw me on the stations. Now I'm not complaining, now I'm not complaining. My thoughts get complicated, I cannot explain the lameness. Never losing focus because I ain't chasing payments. Still playing in the basin while I'm working on arrangements. They heard the kid in 50 countries, thank God that's amazing. But I'd rather thank Spotify, they put me on the station.